Hello, everybody. Welcome to the BNB Connection. This is episode eight uh, with Brad Schoenfeld and myself, Brett Contreras. It's been a while. We took a, a what probably a three month lapse, Brad, or when was the last one we did? Short hiatus. Yeah, this is probably about three, four months. Yep. Yeah, I kept emailing Brad, and he just kept saying he's too busy. He doesn't have time for you guys. Um, apparently, he's gotten really popular. Okay, that's not really true. I was the one who was busy. <laughs> anyway, this uh, edition is going to be on functional training. And Brad and I have been meaning to do this for a while because we get so annoyed over these assumptions and at not just the assumptions, the misguided, um, the, the inaccuracies about the beliefs out there with with strength coaches and personal trainers pertaining to functional training um, and so Brad and I come across this all the time where you'll see a coach just assumes that say like a free weight squat is the end all be all it's going to transfer maximally to everything and if you do a, a machine or some other movement it doesn't have any effects whatsoever and it's completely non-functional meaning it won't do anything for performance. And that doesn't line up with the research. So, Brad, in my position, do you want to state our position, Brad? Yeah, and I think it goes back towards uh, the article that I wrote back in, I think it was 2010 or 11 for ACSM, where uh, functional, it's not functional or non-functional as a binary choice, but rather functional fitness exists on a continuum where some exercises are more functional than others, depending on A number one, the individual, and A number two, the task requirement. You have to consider both of them before you can consider what is a functional or more functional exercise. And that, as a general rule, exercises, there is pretty much no such thing as a non-functional. I guess there could be if it reduces a a given uh, motor pattern that is inherent to the functional thing you want to accomplish. But for the most part, we want to look at functionality on a continuum where there's gradations of transfer. Now, we could talk for uh, several hours on this topic if we expanded it to everything, but we're going to try to hone in on exercises, on, on typical resistance exercises, because we could we could talk about modes of contraction like isometric versus you know concentric versus eccentric velocity specificity um god so many different things isokinetic versus you know iso inertial and all this stuff but what most people the, the biggest topic the biggest uh, mis misguided um concept out there is pertaining to exercise selection and so we have there's a, a lot of studies that look at like one one thing like say the effects of squatting on whatever on performance there's probably like 30 studies right now looking at the squat there's a lot of studies looking at the Olymp Olympic lifts uh, and their transfer to performance but there are not too many comparing different things like comparing squats to leg extensions or squats versus leg press or squats plus leg extensions versus squats alone or something like that. So a lot of our knowledge is just speculative, but if you're going to be evidence-based and speculate according to the literature, then you need to get it right. And we feel that most, most coaches just are completely ignorant and naive to, to, what, to, to true sports science and what really is happening when you, when you perform uh, resistance training. So we will roll through some of the studies, try and keep it brief, and then we will give an overview here. All right, the first study, um, Brad, do you want to talk about the uh, nonogenarian study? This is, uh, what's the name of this? This is, the first study um, was published in 1990 in the JAMA. The title is High Intensity Strength Training in Nonagenarians. Brad, what is a nonagenarian? That's someone who's 90 years plus. So their average age of the subjects was 90 years. Okay, so Brad, <laughs> give us the overview on that study. Yeah, and, and this really to me is the classic study to show that there is a functional fitness continuum and that you don't want to look at exercises as functional or non-functional. 
So what they did was they took a group of nursing home patients, there were 10 nursing home patients, nonagenarians, 90 years old, most of them obviously had very poor functionality, and they put them on eight weeks of leg extension training. Can't think of any exercise that would be considered less functional than a leg extension. You're sitting in a chair, just moving your, your leg up and down, your lower leg. And they did three sets of eight, three times a week. And uh, they did it for eight weeks. After the eight-week period, the average increase in strength was around 170, lower body strength, 175%. And the average improvement in functional ability, measures of walking uh, and other functional tasks, was around 50%. But here, here's what really, to me, jumps out. Two of the 10 subjects were able to ditch their canes and walk without the assistance of their canes. Now, I don't know of anything that is probably more functional than the ability to walk without assistance. And one of the subjects was able to get out of the chair without using their arms. So basically just rise up. Someone who could not before needed to push up out of the chair to get out of the chair was able to get out of a chair without the use of doing it with their arms. So to me, that is, you can't have much better functional transfer there, functional improvements. And really what it shows to me very clearly is that just increasing strength, regardless of the modality, has, and depending on the individual, of course, can have huge improvements in functional transfer. Now, did one of the subjects pull off a backflip, or did I read that wrong? Don't recall seeing that, but you might be right there. So, Brad, this implies that um, now, had they done, had they done, you know, assisted box squats, and then tried to eventually move to regular box squats, maybe it would have been better. The results might, might have been better, but that's not the point. The point was to say basic leg extensions improved functional performance big time. So this, um, this implies that just strengthening the muscle, just strengthening the quadriceps, because the leg extension focuses everything on the vastes and the rectus femoris. And so just strengthening those four muscles, um, you know, you're going to get increases in neural activation, increases in hypertrophy, which lead to increases in strength, and that leads to functional performance improvements. Um, so if... Now, if they would have done, say, box squats or something like that, maybe it would have been better, but that doesn't mean leg extensions wouldn't, even if that study did take place, that doesn't mean leg extensions are worthless because that doesn't mean that box squats plus leg extensions wouldn't see even better improvements. So, all right, that wraps up. And let me also just add one thing to that, too. I, I would also, or two things, actually. Number one, I would say that I would doubt that those, given the deconditioned state of those people, that probably the squat would have been a good movement or certainly like a box squat that they would have been able to accomplish that without huge degrees of assistance. So when you talk assistance, so again, that's, it's arguable, but it might not be a lot of times a progression. Basically you're uh, regressing to a move to be able to progress uh, that you can take at that. And, and again, I think just more to your point is, is that really what this shows is, is that we shouldn't look at exercises as non-functional. That it's not that an exercise, well, that's, there's, we do a machine, it's not, we don't move that way, so it's non-functional. That's really just a silly way to look at things. Okay, next study we will talk about is uh, the effect of open and closed kinetic chain exercises on dynamic balance ability of normal healthy adults. Brad, do you remember this one? Yeah, I do. Uh, they looked at um, an open and chain movements. They did a dynamic balance test where it was a diagonal step one way to the left and then to the right. And what they found in, in summary was that the both open and chain and closed chain movements did produce improvements in, in dynamic balance, but that the closed chain had somewhat greater improvements. So it wasn't that there was no transfer from the open chain, but that, as you would expect, there is a that continuum, and you did see greater dynamic balance improvements in the closed chain. And as again, at the important point, as you said, they did not look at a combination of open and closed chain, which to me is, look, one thing, and we can talk about this a little more at the end, but 
bodybuilding is often thought of as a non-functional type of training system. Well, bodybuilders use both uh, free weight type moves, closed chain free weight moves, as well as open chain machines and, and combinations of such. So to to say that it is non-functional, well, they're using combinations of these. That has never been looked at, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Even powerlifters will use assistance exercises. So. Right. Um, okay, so take-home point there is if you have to choose between open and closed kinetic chain exercises and your goal is to improve balance, then closed chain exercises are going to be better, but you might see the best results doing a combination of training that hasn't been looked at. Okay. By the way, Bert, one thing that I think that was good about this study is they looked at dynamic balance rather than static balance, which is generally what most studies look at. They look at static balance, standing on one leg, and obviously, or I would think obviously, that the dynamic balance in most functional tasks is the more important variable than static balance. Most people, if they're going to need balance, it's during dynamic movement, not during, uh, during quiet standing. Yep, agreed. All right, next paper, specificity of machine, barbell, and water-filled log bench press resistance training on measures of strength. Um, this was 2007, JSCR, um, and this one, uh, Bradley, this one they gave, uh, they had subjects either do machine bench press, barbell bench press, or log, log bench press. And they looked at, what was nice about this is they looked at the transfer to each type. Well, so if your functional goal is to just bench the most weight, well, it depends on what type of bench. If you want to log press, log, pre, log bench the most weight, then the study showed that you should use a log. If you wanted a machine bench the most weight, then you got the best results from doing machine bench press. If you want to bench press the most weight, you got the best results out of the barbell, um, barbell bench press, which makes sense with specificity, but the take-home point is that they all transfer to each other. So, and there were no statistic, uh, statistical significance between, between um, all of the three variations. However, if you just kind of look at the chart and don't look at statistical significance, you can, you can see that specificity occurred you did get more strength gains if you're so if your goal is to, to gain the most on barbell bench press then you would do barbell bench press but machine and log bench still transfer to barbell and they all transfer each other they also looked at just bench press force production and the barbell saw the best improvements but again they didn't do combine a combination of them and it does show that everything transfer everything transfers everything is functional it's just that some things are better than others and two two things here Brett as you pointed out I, I do think the fact that they didn't look at combinations and, and I wouldn't think they could it's just obviously in a research study it gets very difficult to uh, to control to have that type of to, to carry out studies where you're looking at that many subjects so it's certainly I understand the limitations but you can make a case that increasing hypertrophy, that a combination of machines which might target more in certain aspects of the ch chest, combined with the neural aspects of a free weight bench, might transfer better because increased muscle hypertrophy does show there is a, uh, a clear relationship between cross-sectional area and force production. I also do want to point out, though, that an upper body, I, I would also posit that an upper body exercise is not as... The, the functional transfer is not as great as the lower body. And I can tell you from experience on the study I just carried out, um, where we had some of the subjects, they were all resistance trained subjects, but some of them just for the lower body did the leg presses and leg extensions, and they had the biggest increases in the squat. They were very large differences in many of the cases there. Uh, I think we had four subjects who didn't uh, squat and um, you do see great, because the squat is a much more complex move than a bench press, you're going to see greater than transfer and just the coordination of that movement from a machine to a natural free weight movement. However, if we're going to be consistent with this, like this looked at three different bench presses this way, 
if you did three different types of squats, like a barbell squat versus a lever machine squat versus a log filled, you know, water filled log squat, my guess is you, you would, it would be just the same as this study. But like if you did pec deck and tricep extension, you're not going to see that much gains in bench press strength compared uh, to bench. I would disagree with you because there's a much greater balance, proprioceptive aspect to a squat than there is a bench press. So I do think that, now I, I agree there probably would be less variation than from a leg press, but I do think you'd see that, again, it goes back to a continuum, where I think the leg press would be much further down on the continuum. No, I'm not talking leg squat. press, I'm saying like a, like a squat, barbell no, squat, I'm, a log squat, and then like a lever machine squat. But if you did leg press and leg extensions, they're not going to transfer the squat as much, but... But in terms I, I do think that you wouldn't see the same. My point is with a lever machine squat versus a regular squat, I think you would see less transfer than a bench press to a machine bench press. Right. Regular barbell to a machine. Just because of the proprioceptive aspects of being able to maintain balance in three-dimensional space, whereas a bench press, you're lying down and just pushing up with a barbell in one. You still have three dimensions, but it's there's much less of a balance. It's not as complicated. Right, right, right. But I would agree with you on your premise earlier that if you did squats and lever squats in the same session, say twice a week, you might be able to get even better gains than if you just did one or the other because mm -hmm. the benefits of the lever machine are that you can control trunk angle, really you can you know you can control and you don't have to worry about balance, you can just worry about force production and um, which might lead to you know, more hypertrophy of a certain muscle or, you know, they, they might have synergistic effects. That has not been looked at yet. Brad and I want to do some of this research as time goes on. Yeah, and that's, so your exact point, and that's what we've talked We're about. We're just waiting for Brad him. to get his PhD so we can carry out some of this research. He's lagging well, on, you actually, know? Actually, so one of the studies <laughs> that Brett and I actually will be looking at, and I, uh, this is on my, my plate, my very full plate at this point, but it's going to happen, is uh, looking at six sets of squats, six sets of leg presses, or three sets of squats, three sets of leg presses, and looking to see what the functional transfer. My thought, certainly my hypothesis would be, that as long as you're getting the squatting in, doing the additional squat, you'd have greater, uh, greater results from adding in some leg presses rather than just doing the full six sets of squats. As long as you're getting those three sets, that's enough for the neural adaptations where you can then see greater results by adding in some yep. additional... That's, uh, that's, my, that's my hypothesis, too. And my... <laughs> same hypothesis as me. <laughs> my thesis for my PhD is uh, going to look at squats versus hip thrusts versus squats plus hip thrusts. So it's the same study as yours, but instead of leg extensions, hip thrusts. And I thought and of it... Hip thrusts are non-functional. So. Yeah, right. And I thought of it before you, so you stole my idea. <laughs> okay. Um, going, finishing off here, we've got two more to talk about. This next one is strength outcomes in fixed versus freeform resistance equipment. This was JSCR 2008, and Brad, talk about this one. Yeah, that was the Spenderman study you're talking yep. about. Yeah, so what Spenderman did was he looked at, and this was actually an interesting study, he looked at um, machines, your fixed machines, which only move in one plane of movement, versus a free-form machine, like the free motion equipment cable type apparatus, which move in three dimensional planes. And he did a full body workout, looking at all the working all the major muscle groups. And the bottom line was that he did uh, tests of strength and balance. And the strength test, uh, they showed, if I recall, you might correct me on this, but about what was it? What was about? I remember that you got significant. I don't remember the exact amount, but there was uh, substantial increases in strength, significant, and substantial increases in strength in the fixed uh, movements. But the Freeform movements had roughly double. It was like 50% versus 100%, somewhere in there, increases in strength, where the freeform actually had double the increases. And with balance, now, with the, so we'll talk about the issues with the balance, but balance showed about 50% increases with the freeform, but there was 250, so it was a five-fold increase 
in the uh, yep. free form equipment. It was a fifty-seven percent increase in strength from the fixed from the machine training, one hundred and fifteen percent from the free form. 49% in balance in the machines and 245% in balance in the free form. Yeah. Now the, the issue was is that first of all the testing for the strength I believe was on a free form wasn't it on free no, form? No, no, no. This is my problem with the study is it was in their various so that the machines they increased they, they used machines to test oh, right. for the pre right, and post right. were for machine group and then the free form did pre and post with the free form and it's like, it reminds me of the first time I did, uh, <laughs> the first time my friend Chad Waterbury tried to show me ring dips. And I could do a dip with, with like, three forty-fives and a 25. I mean, that's what, 131, 160, I can do a 160 pound weighted dip, but I could not do one ring dip. It was so hard for me. And after like, you know, 10 minutes of practice, I finally got to where I could do two of them. But it's so unstable. It's a whole different thing, you know. And the this so the free motion had way better. You're going to start out with that, and you're going to be so uncoordinated, and you're going to get way better at it through intramuscular coordination gains. So I feel like that was I would if I were a peer reviewer for that study, I would have had a hard uh, you know a hard time with that because it would just uh, you know the the machine group it's not as coordinative. So you just push. You don't have to coordinate as much, so you don't have as much room to gain. So I don't like that. And also the balance test was on a standing on a BOSU ball with the dome yeah. up. And I don't, you know, I don't think that's as functional as people well, think. Right. And that's what we mentioned before, is that if you're going to look at balance, really dynamic balance, quiet balance, standing on one leg on a BOSU, I'm not sure what the functional transfer is. You could call that a test of balance, which it is. But how much does that transfer to the functional task? Yeah, like That's something on quite it. Quite suspect. Yeah, okay, and then last paper we will talk about. This is a really good paper. This is by Blazevich. This is called uh, Training Specific Muscle Ar Architecture Ad Adaptation After Five Weeks of Training in Athletes. Um, this was uh, published in the Medicine and, and Science and Sport and Exer Sports and Exercise Journal. Uh, what year was this? This was a while back. This was a uh, date here. 2003. And this study looked at, they had one group just did sprinting and jumping. One group added in, if you can see on the computer screen here, this forward hack squat. One-legged forward hack squat. Uh, where they're standing backwards on the hack squat machine doing a one-legged hack squat and the other group did squats and this was a very interesting article because you look at the charts there were so there were no they were looked at all sorts of things they looked at 10 and 20 meter sprints one and two legged vertical jumps they looked at all kinds of force production and you know at different speeds and things like that However, they showed no significant differences, but if you go in and look at the charts, what was interesting is that the, the forward hack squat group actually saw, the, saw better gains in sprinting than the squat group, but the squat group saw better gains than the vertical jump group. And then, of course, if you're looking at squat force, the squat group saw better gains in squatting. And so this, but even the, like, um, the fascicle length and angle changes were identical between the forward hack squat and the squat group. Um, so, and what was interesting, the group that did not do any weight training actually increased their fascicle length and angle, um, which was interesting because they ceased strength training. But that's kind of outside the scope of this discussion. But anyway, the point is, if it would make sense that you'd see better results you know, oh, and they did supplementary exercises too. They did back extensions, leg curls, and calf raises, machine calf raises. And so according to most strength coaches out there, the, the group that did the forward hack squat was a machine exercise. The back extension is non-standing. You're in an apparatus. The, the, the 
leg curl is non-functional according to most coaches. The standing calf raises in a machine, and they imp they improved performance. They got faster, and this just goes to show you. And they got faster than the squat group did. And these now, are trained athletes. Too. Yeah, and these are trained athletes. And then the squat group the squat group saw better jumping gains. So if you combined the the theoretically speaking, if you combine now this was a short study, it was only five weeks, but still, if you combine the forward the unilateral forward hack squat and the squat study, the sorry the squat squatting, then you might have seen even better results. So this just goes to show you that. As we stated earlier, functional training is on a continuum. It's not like this is completely, this is the end all be all, and you get your, you know, functional capacity goes through the roof doing this, but if you do this, it goes down or doesn't change at all. It's a continuum, and some things are better for certain things than others. The, the law of specificity applies, but combined training can give you better results. So, um, so now that we've discussed the articles, there's a lot of review, review, good review papers on the topic too, and we will link these in the blog post. But now let's just discuss functional training um, and kind of the the ramifications of these uh, these studies. So my biggest problem, Brad, is that most clients, you know, I think that I probably trained a thousand people in my lifetime, and I I would say. 900 of them came to me primarily for to look better for physique enhancement, right? What would you say the percentage is with you? You you trained thousands yeah. of people in your time. I came up with the phrase look great naked because that was 90% of my clients were coming in saying, I really don't care. What do you want to do? I just want to look better. I want to look good without my clothes on. I don't really care about the health. And obviously that's important to them when they really thought about it. But most people are very aesthetically based. You know, it, as you get people get older, so yeah, when you're 70, you're not looking to the bikini years probably are behind you or the tank top. That's not what your your focus is at that point. But certainly in your younger set, certainly under 50, I would say, when under 50, the vast majority are, are aesthetically driven. And most people don't come in and say, you know, my goal is to increase, but like vertical jump or my, you know, 40 right. meter dash time. But, to carry my chub. now, again, you would get some people I want to carry my child, but that, those are, those are secondary considerations. Yeah, because. they're added benefits. But the point is, you, they're, like, let's say you incorporate, uh, you know, and some machines or apparatuses let you target strength curves that you can't get with free weights. A lot of free weight movements, they have torque angle curves that dissipate it in range. And so you, you need to add in these other things for balance. Well, for example, if you just squatted, if you just did squats, that was your only lower body exercise, first of all, you're not going to strengthen the hamstrings uh, optimally. And second of all, you're not going to get in range hip extension strength. You'll get initial flexed range hip extension strength. You'll build the quadriceps very well. You'll build up the glutes. You won't build up glute strength at in range. You won't build the hamstring strength. So you need supplemental exercises to optimize performance here, um, and so yeah. And if I can add in there, the, the length, many your biarticular, many biarticular mus muscles need targeted training, need uh, single joint training to optimize the length tension relationship. Your gastrocnemius, your hamstrings, your rectus femoris, biceps brachii, long head, and triceps. All of them are at a, an impaired uh, length tension through various ranges of multi joint movements. And really, unless you put them in a position where you fix them at the at one end while you're training them at the other, you're not going to optimally develop that muscle, both from a strength and, and hypertrophy standpoint. So. And, and my another thing I wanted to talk about, like it blows my mind when these people act like you can, you know, that you can only these co coaches and trainers out there, they clearly haven't studied the literature because they'll act like this is a worthless, you know, x, you know, fill in whatever. Because, you know, Brad, one thing about you and I, we never, you'll never hear us say that this exercise is useless. No, we'll ne we've never said that. But I've heard this say, I've heard people say you should not squat, you should not deadlift, you should not bench press, you should not do leg extensions, you should not do leg press, you should not do bent over rows, you should not do dips, you should not do military press, you should not do chin-ups, you should not do hip thrusts, you should not do lunges, you should not do lying leg curls. Um, you should not do crunches, you should not do sit-ups, 
Um, God, the list goes on. You should not do kettlebell swings. The, the Olympic lifts, the list goes on and on. And so we need to have some sort of objective way of discussing, you know, uh, certainly anatomy comes into play, and you've got to learn good form. Not every human being is meant to do rock bottom full squats, but they can still squat. You know, I've, I've squatted every client I've ever trained did some type of squat. They did hip thrust. They did some form of deadlifting. You, they might not be able to do, um, you know, deadlifts from the floor or like deficit deadlifts. They might not be able to do, you know, rock bottom ass to grass squats, but they could do high box squats or goblet squats or something, you know. And so, but my my point is, you you get better results from doing more than one exercise. Like no, I don't see who would argue that you can only just do one exercise. So. It's not about not doing this. It's about in, in do, you know adhering to a well-rounded routine. So, if, and the next thing is, well, it, and hold on, let me just add though. It's also looking at the principle of individual differences. Central tenet of training uh, suggests that some exercise for certain people might not be the best solution, and that you have to look at the person's body habits and other factors. And also, what are they looking to accomplish? You're going to train an athlete. I think one real important point here is that we try, we'll take people and strength coaches, will try to take the training of athletes and apply them to your everyday people. And your everyday people are not athletes and they don't have the same goals. For most people, their task requirements are very, very slight. So what they're gonna need to do, the, the types of training you're gonna need to do to make them uh, able to complete their activities of daily living goes nowhere near what you would need for an athlete. And, and, it, it really is overkill. How many people need to lift boulders? I guess there might be people who are moving their, or, or populating their lawn, doing landscaping, and they're lifting heavy. In that case, maybe doing boulder lift strength, uh, basic strength uh, moves, your strongman type moves, might be appropriate for them to optimize their task. But your, your stockbroker, your mom, your new, new mom, the vast majority of people, certainly that all of us have trained, have very modest task requirements and that your the generalized training is going to get them if they're looking to get if their goal is to get aesthetically better that's going to help them to achieve what it basically whatever they need to achieve in their everyday tasks so you, you have to really analyze now if they have other um, goals if they're if their goals are to hike Mount Everest you'd have obviously you'd put uh, other types of training in there but for, again, the vast majority, just to, to use, again, a, a catch-all of functional fitness, functional fitness is specific to the person. What are their functional goals and needs? It's not there's a functional fitness that everyone needs to achieve a certain degree of function. It's kind of silly. Now, to piggyback off what Brad's saying, think of my situation. Most of my clients come to me wanting glutes. They are not happy with their glute development. They've tried other routines. If the if the previous routine worked for them, they wouldn't have found me because they wouldn't be typing into Google, you know, how to get nice glutes or something like that. And so they find me, and their goal is glutes, and I give them I prioritize glute development. And so they will notice once they prioritize their glutes, they start noticing all sorts of functional improvements. But that's my original goal was just to help them grow glutes. But they start saying I'm sprinting faster. Um, I'm, I, I'm, you know, carrying my groceries up, you know, three flights of stairs, no problem. I'm hiking better. I'm running fat, uh, you know, doing my long distance run and they improved. Um, my low back pain is, 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 it went away. My knee pain went away. My hip pain went away, things like that. And those are, those are all functional side effects, but you know, it's, it's from a well-balanced comprehensive glute training routine. In which case, you're going to do a lot of exercise that might not appear functional. For example, look at the hip thrust. You're on the ground with a bar in your lap, humping up and down. Well, does that transfer to performance? Hell yeah, it does. You're hip thrusting. You're strengthening the glutes at end range hip extension. That's the same range of motion where it where, uh, associated with ground contact in running and sprinting. So if you're also sprinting, and this is another thing, Whatever your goal, if you have a performance goal in mind, you better be doing that activity. For example, 
If you want to squat the most weight, you need to be squatting. If powerlifting is your goal, you're going to be doing squats, bench, and deadlifts. Now, some guys who have shoulder issues will do a lot of their training with a safety squat bar or something like that, or a Swiss bar with bench press, but then right before the meet, they'll switch to a couple weeks of specificity, and that's to preserve their joints. But the point is, you want to be doing specificity. If your goal is to sprint as fast as possible, you better be doing sprints. That's the most important part of it. But you add in these other things, and it's going to help. Will adding in hip thrusts help? Yeah, they will. Will adding in... Um, Cable exercises, you know, they're not free weights, but you can train different, you know, ro rotational patterns and things like that that can build core and glute strength as a hip external rotator, and they can help you twist faster when you do ro in your rotational sport, throw faster, swing ha harder. And so to me, you want to look at all these things, and you want to make sure you're doing a well-balanced routine, and it all depends on the goals of the lifter. Of course, you don't want to be doing dangerous exercises that are going to drive this person into the ground and not and not let them keep training. But if you vary things and you have good form, there's a lot of different options and there's a lot of ways to to you know put together a, an effective strength and conditioning program that helps the person achieve their goals, improves their function, and keeps them healthy. I agree. All right, Bradley. Do you have anything else to add? Well, just again, I think it's real important to reiterate that functional transfer, it's not a binary functional versus non-functional, that it exists on a continuum, that really the uh, astute fitness pro is going to take into account the needs and abilities of the individual, as well as the task requirements, uh, and then create their plan accordingly. And I would say that for the vast majority of people, the thought of functional fitness, while it sounds very cool and, and create, it's a nice buzzword, that uh, just general type training where you're combining exercises and even bodybuilding training, that movements over muscles really doesn't, for, for an athlete, yeah, that's where you're going to start to see that. But uh, for the vast majority of training in a bodybuilding type routine, well, I, I've never seen a bodybuilder uh, that cannot lift a package or lift a baby and do functional tasks. So uh, I, I think also, that it's highly overblown. If the bodybuilders don't lose flexibility like people think, but they're on a lot of different drugs that help them grow to massive proportions. That's not going to happen with other people. If their flexibility is impaired because their muscles are so large right. that they can't move through full range right. of motion. That's, yeah, that is not the, most but, people are not going to have that problem. Yeah. You and I don't have that problem, Brad. And, well, I do. I do. Yeah. Well, my, my problem is, why would you yeah, not want to... Yeah, as far as I go here, it's just their <laughs> biceps and the like, come up. <laughs> Your imaginary lat syndrome is pretty apparent right now. Um, but uh, why would you not look? I've never understood this because as a I'm you know as a personal trainer, I've always wanted to know. I've been I marvel at what the Olympic lifters do, and they do things very differently. You know, depending on the country. But I want to know how they train because they're the most powerful individuals in the world, right? I want to know how the track and field athletes train which is kind of funny because a lot of the Jamaican team, they do their sprints and their plyos and sled work, and then they go in the weight room and do a lot of machines. A lot of coaches would be like, that's, you know, so stupid, and that's the, and they're the fastest runners, you know, sprinters in the world. But because uh, um, they have it right, they realize with sprinting, you need to sprint a lot and kind of stay fresh and then just get the muscles stronger in the right ranges. They'll do cable hip flexion. They'll do the glute, you know, um, quadruped glute blaster machine where you're just kicking your leg upwards similar to hip thrust where you're strengthening end range hip extension strength but you know they're not prioritizing heavy barbell strength but it works for them I want to know what the bodybuilders are doing they're the masters of hypertrophy they know how to get bigger and they know it better than anyone I want to know what the powerlifters are doing they know how to increase bench squat and deadlift great better than anyone and you can apply what they know about strength development to the other lifts, too. You know, they know how to do maximal effort training, submaximal effort training, dynamic effort you know, training, and doing all these, you know, specificity, but also some variety with your supplemental and accessory lifts. And they know how to get strong. But they will, they will if you listen to a powerlifter, they'll say the squat, the deadlift, and the bench are here, and everything else is rendered 
as an assistance or supplementary lift. For them, that's true because all yep. they need to do is the squat bench. Right, and, but in and if you're an athlete, so if your goal they is that from a functional transfer standpoint, that's the case for for their lifts. That's all they're required to get good in the squat, then lift, and, and bench. So that's for them. That right, is all there is. But if your goal is glute development, you're you might have three three li other lifts that are the core lifts, and these are all supplementary accessory. Or if your goal is to hit a baseball as far as possible, you might pick these to be your three core right. lifts. So right. it depends on your goal. It depends on, you know, if, if your goal is physique versus functional, you know, if it's high performance or just basic walking or whatever. Okay. So learn from the different camps. Learn from the strongmen, the Olympic weightlifters, the bodybuilders, um, the powerlifters, the athletes, the different types of athletes in the Olympic you know, um, uh, sports and how they train and pick up pieces from all of it. It all helps. And when you train, when you do personal training, I can tell you the more methods you know of, the bigger tool set you have, you might stick most of the time to these 10 movements. But when you utilize other approaches, when you have them push a prowler, when you have them doing, you know, some, some plyos or stuff like that, when you add in some of this stuff, they like it. You get more clients. When you do hip thrusts and the, the clients start developing glutes, they like it. They refer other people and then you have more, you know, and everyone's happy. You get more clients, they see better results. Word of mouth spreads. I've never understood this um, in the fitness, you know, out there on the inter interwebs, you will see so many people bashing me methods and, and um, you know, effective modalities. I never think it. And that goes to this and it goes to other... Just generally pervades the industry a lot where it's, it's do this, you either do this or that. There's no in between. And it's just a silly way to, to look at training. It's, uh, you, will, you will never achieve your optimal goals unless you take a broad-based approach and look to combine methods. To me, the, the thought of, of this or that is not only antiquated, it's misguided. So. Agreed. Okay, that concludes episode... Eight? Was it eight? Episode eight. Um, again, we apologize for taking so long to come out with a new one. Um, but we hope you enjoyed listening to this one. Thank you for watching.